We live in a world filled with the unknown. Ghosts and spirits wander through our physical dimension. Unknown creatures lurk in the shadows, and strange lights and craft dominate our skies. Credible eyewitnesses are convinced these things are real, yet modern science refuses to acknowledge their existence. So it's up to individual researchers to search for the truth. Welcome to Unknown Origins Radio. Good evening, everybody, <laughs> and welcome to another edition of Unknown Origins Radio, where we talk about everything having to do with the strange and paranormal. I'm your host, Mark Johnson, and with me as usual tonight are our lovely co-host, Lauren DePinto. Hey, Lauren. Konnichiwa. I had to say that. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> agree, somebody greeted me in the chat room like that. Konnichiwa. <laughs> <laughs> and Carrie Ann Versace. How are you doing, Carrie Ann? Oh. I think yep. Carrie Ann uh, is stepping in in just a second. Yeah, she she said she'd be back in a second, and I guess uh, she needed more longer than a second. So she'll be with us in a moment. But anyway, uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in for an, another fine adventure tonight. We have an excellent show planned here for you. Uh, coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to be having our special guest, Erin Ryder, joining us. She's uh, one of the co-stars of two shows on the on right now between Destination Truth and Chasing UFOs, so we're really excited to talk to her. And uh, this has just been a uh, strange week uh, in the paranormal news uh, I've just, there's been a couple of weird things happening. Now, of course, the Olympics just started the other night. Oh, yes. Yeah. Have you been watching? Uh, I have not. <laughs> See, it's nice because you could tune in whenever you want. Pick a sport, you know, and just kind of like, you know, write it down and go, okay, I'm going to be tuning in at 10 o'clock. Or you could tape it now. Yeah, you know what? I just have no interest in it. Um, you know, occasionally maybe if something was playing, if they had like, you know, high diving or, or, you know, what's the one where they, you know, ski and shoot and, you know, when they blast oh, the luge, uh, the luge. Yeah, but that's that's, of course, the uh, the winter Olympics. And that's another two right, years. Right. Yes. yes. See, I was living in Los Angeles back in 84 when we had the Olympics out there. And oh, what a nightmare that was. Oh, Between really? Traffic. And the only good thing is my dad, uh, he was a truck driver at that time working for Cisco, you know, the food company. Sure. And, and they were catering the Olympics. And he had so much leftover food that they would give him. He was bringing home crates of lobster. Every You're night. kidding. Oh, my oh, gosh. We ate well during the Olympics that year. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. But didn't, wasn't there something strange in the news about the Olympics, like a UFO sighting? Yeah, they're saying that uh, during the Olympic opening ceremony that uh, there was a UFO sighted uh, up, up in the air. And, you know, so the news came on. First, they were trying to dismiss it as the Goodyear blimp. Right. But when you take a look at this thing, it's not blimp shaped. I used to see the Goodyear blimp. I know what the Goodyear blimp looks like. This is not a blimp. It's flat on the bottom. It's uh, very illuminated with no features. Right, and right. it does kind of have like that classic saucer dick disc shape. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say it's an, it's a spaceship. Uh, mm -hmm. but you know, the UFO term does apply. It's unidentified flying object. We don't know what it is, but, uh, very, very strange. Hmm, that is weird. And and the, it was spotted during the opening ceremony. So is that where the fireworks are erupting over the stadium? Uh, yeah, somewhere along that. I, I actually haven't seen the video. I've only seen some of the still shots right. of where it was located. But I guess a lot of people saw it when it was happening. Some a lot of people thought it was part of the event. Um, but, you know, it wasn't. And we really still don't know what it was. So, you know, maybe uh, somebody from Alpha Centauri decided to come down and <laughs> check out our Olympics and Yes, see how hard it is to get tickets? It's really tough. So, I mean, you have to kind of do what you have to do, even if you have to hover over the stadium. <laughs> now, did you hear what they actually did? They really screwed up. I think this happened yesterday, where they accidentally extinguished the Olympic torch. Oh, good God. <laughs> they, no, they I didn't. <laughs> moving the torch from outside to inside. Oh. Of course, they were doing it so only paid paid, paid uh, ticket holders could actually still see the torch burning during the indoor Olympics. So the rest of the public outside couldn't see it. But in moving it, somebody actually spilled water or something on it and doused the oh, torch. Come on. The That's Olympic an epic torch fail. has been doused in <laughs> like a century. It's like, way to go, guys. Oh, man. Who's going to get, who's going to take the blame for that one? That's terrible. Oh, that is, that's a major faux pas in every way. <laughs> there she is. Hello, Carrie. Hello. Ann. Sorry I'm late. Sorry I'm late. That's quite How all right. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm trying to bounce back 
from a crazy weekend. Yeah, we were yeah. going to ask, uh, can we talk about this weekend? Sure, why not? Okay. Some, I was, just, okay. So, why don't uh, you tell everybody where you were? I was at the last darkness event at Eastern State penitentiary this weekend and uh it was it was pretty excellent you know first off it's my first time really at eastern state uh i've been there for the terror behind the walls thing but it's you know it's it's nothing compared to actually being in there and and going in all the areas and getting to work with some of the great names in the business was pretty amazing i actually got to meet um aaron from ghost adventures That's what right. what a guy let me tell you he is what you see on tv is he, he is. as sweet as, as he as is a big sweet bear? Aww. He's really nice and and actually him and, and uh, Brian hit it off really well. This first time meeting too and and uh, it was you know it was really really a fun event. Dave throws a good shindig, let me tell you. Oh, and of I course, can't wait. Mr. Sagers is always a pleasure and <laughs> and Jeff <laughs> Jeff Ballinger, you know. So oh. you know, man so, about town. So yeah. it was like like a, like a little phenom reunion. Oh yeah, you know if our listeners never get to go to a, a, a paranormal convention, they're really missing out because honestly, it is like extended family at all of these. You know, it's like so much fun. I mean, everyone is so nice. There's never really any drama. I mean, there's it was you know a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun and seeing old faces and making new friends this past weekend. You know, you come home and. You got a hundred more friend requests. <laughs> it, it feels good. It really does. It feels That's good. fantastic. Now it's, it's, this is the second to the last event. So was it a little bittersweet, you know, on the last day? It was, it was, oh. you know, but, uh, I think a lot of these people go to the same events. I think, uh, they're all, you know, gearing up for the Stanley. I got to be Bill Chappell, Chappell. Ooh. And, uh, I got some, some deep, some deep answers to some questions that I've been uh, wondering about, and uh, he's a pretty cool dude. He's actually going to come on a show sometime uh, oh, and maybe talk to us. And oh, he does not cool. do interviews, so uh, it'll be wow. a rare thing to have him on. He, he's what a, a privilege. You used yeah. your terms to wile him into. <laughs> That's so yeah. great, and oh, so that's great. And and next week we're gonna have Dave Schrader actually on, so that's gonna be great. You know, we get to hear him recap the weekend as well. Yep, and uh, George Nori was there. And, wow, uh, he's a legend. What a, yeah, what a funny, quick little funny story is. Uh, you know, Dave is telling the story when George was up there. He goes, you know, since it's always it's like a you know a darkness gack thing that it's always you know a combined effort. He always runs past the guests past Aaron and uh, he said to Aaron he goes oh he goes I was able to get George Norrie is that okay he said that Aaron act like a four four year old little girl like <laughs> his whole family loves George Norrie he listens they're all like he said what did he say they're like his family he's like the religion of George Norrie so uh, <laughs> he's like he, it was funny he was like a little fanboy for George he was all excited so it was really cute watching oh, that too. Oh, that's excellent. that was the first time he met George Norrie I think so yeah it was the first time he got to meet him and talk to him and he's like he, he, I was sitting next to him during the lecture he's like I feel like I should be in bed it feels like it should be bedtime because <laughs> George is lecturing <laughs> when George's show is on oh but, yeah, that's was, so cute it was that's good excellent. And how were the investigations? Um, the investigations were very good. You know, what it is is, in, you know, in each area you have a, a paracelebs set up and they'll go over. They each have their own little way of investigating. So let me tell you, getting to sit with the Constantinos and Aaron, uh, it was like watching an episode of Ghost Adventures Live right in front of me. You know, it was, it was, it was fun. It was fun. And, and uh, Chris Fleming was there as well. And uh, Billy Tolley from Ghost Adventures was there. So you're going to have a good time when you go to the Stanley. I cannot wait. It's great. Hey, it's good that we have, you know, you represented this weekend. I'll represent that weekend. It's, I'm, I'm excited. I am really excited. Dave, be prepared. I'll see you in Denver. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question, though. Now, did Brian, I saw this on Facebook, and I don't know how true this is, did he get spirit punched in the family jewels? What's the Actually, truth of that? He did, but that wasn't this weekend. That was oh. when... When Scared filmed their episode there. Oh, okay. But I think Chris Fleming got hit this weekend. Yeah, oh, I believe it was, it was he who got hit this weekend. So, yeah. 
You know, Chris must have been a bad boy. You know, he's getting punished in prison. <laughs> well, you know, he's got that face. He's got a face. <laughs> I'm sure they, you know, a lot of prisoners would have liked to have him as his. Hey, oh! <laughs> <laughs> what? I was going to say cellmate. cellmate. I was just, oh, I was just going to oh, say cellmate. Cellmate, not shower. Yeah, don't drop the soap. <laughs> he's, a, he's a cutie. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, that so. was like when you guys went to the, um, the, to the, uh, what was the West Virginia penitentiary? Or the or was it Mansfield Mansfield where they have the sugar shack. Oh, that's Mansfield. Good Mansfield. Sugar shack. <laughs> Take on down a little. Day. We'll go down down to the sugar shack. Ooh, yikes. Well, for for the darkness event, they opened up the hole, which is actually down in the hole. I mean, uh, you know, I, I wish I had known. I mean, it was like I really didn't know I was going. It was like a last minute thing, and um, you know, Aaron actually was Aaron Sagers was actually uh, posting live stuff all weekend on paranormal doc, uh, pop culture. He was having live bologs and people were sitting down and chatting with him. So um, you could have actually watched a lot of things going on from there. It was, I think you probably could still catch up on it, but I mean, it was a lot of fun. And Frank was there. He says, hi, you had a couple. Oh, of you had a couple oh really? Yeah. A lot of our friends from the sun Inn were there too. So it, it was a lot of fun. Oh, I, I really wish I could have gone, but uh, oh, just swing shoot. it this time. Yeah, I mean, if you can try swinging the Stanley Mark, you should really try to go. I think there's already sold out for that. Oh, I don't it might know. Might be. I don't know. Yeah. yeah well, look at that. Fortunately, it's, it, it doesn't look like I'm going to be doing much events until uh, Phenomenology in March. So, uh, unless, you know, hopefully things will change. If they do, I'll, I'll definitely be there because these sound like a lot of fun. You guys, you, it's your, it's both of your faults, by the way. Now you've got <laughs> a convention kick. Now I'm just looking at all these conventions and go, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. You know, it's, it's bittersweet though, Mark. You know, you, you're on this raging high for two, three days or, and then all of a sudden you come home and you're like, oh. Oh well, yeah, it's first, that crash. Yeah, that's first sadness. You're, at first you're exhausted and then it's, oh, back to reality. Oh yeah, my day job and oh yeah, Aww. bills and oh yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it is. It's, it's truly the perfect getaway. It really is so much fun. It really is because we feed off of each other's energy. You know, it's so positive and upbeat and everybody's laughing and hugging and, you know. Oh, was well, there- <laughs> that was so, uh, I, I, I got to mention that. So I'm working with Patrick and Marley. And you know what? I know Patrick and Marley so long, but I've never actually got to work with them. And we're yeah. doing a, um EVP session. And um clear as day, a kitty cat me out. And it was. Oh, no. There was no cat around. None of us heard it, and it was so clear. And all of us just went, oh, you know. Of course, we're all cat people, but it was. You know, we were getting some clear EVPs. There was a lot of activity. You know, people were seeing shadow people left and right, and you know, um, who were getting touched and getting some great EVPs. Um, sorry to say, you know, uh, the Constantinos lost their dog. I on, saw uh, that. Friday night. Oh. And uh, we actually did an EVP session. You know, Debbie was a little upset. And she wanted to reach out to see if anyone out there, because she communicates with these people all the time, knew anything right. about her dog. And honest to God, we got the dog is fine. And wow. he's, in a ha- he's in a happier place. Like, Debbie was like, is he okay? Because she was very upset. Is oh. he okay? Was he in pain? Is he happy? And oh. he's in a happy he's in a happy place now. He's he's okay and like direct responses again never disappointing. That's oh, amazing. You know, never disappointing. So like you know if anyone ever off there thinks they're they're tampering with something you know this was unexpected and we were getting answers they say you know they they knew they were coming to a prison but they didn't know about their dog and these EVPs were straight responses to these dogs to this dog you know so. It was Aww. something else. It was something else. Oh, I'm so glad that she got that kind of a closure. And yeah, I mean, you and I have both been through that loss this just, past couple of months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, you know, to get that kind of validity and then to get that kind of message it makes you feel so good. Oh, I'm yeah. so glad for her. Aww. Good. I'm so glad you had a great time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, That's fun. great. Now I want to see pictures. Did you take pictures? You know what? I actually was very well, well they're all popping up on my wall. I mean, oh. you know. There's not much you could do about it, but they're there. <laughs> now wait a minute. I know Mel, I know Mel was there, and Mel took oh, pictures. And I, there's yeah. got to be about three, four thousand coming up. <laughs> oh yeah, Rasha, Rasha, uh, 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 Rasha just posted a whole bunch of uh, oh. group goofiness, and you know they're all going to pop up. 
I took my I took my Aaron sandwich. Okay, I have to say it. Yes, I just thought that I, I, said, I was going to put that. The Aaron squared, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I was being polite for Facebook, but we're on the radio, and I'm like, that's a sandwich I can have every day. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> you were the meat. You were the meat. Oh. <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, race. I can see a race back there. How are you doing, race? <laughs> I'm blushing now. <laughs> I was keeping a uh, G for Facebook, but it will go on. But no, it was a lot of fun. I was like, oh, you too? I, I need this picture. That's for sure. So, yeah, I, I took very few pictures. You know, I have so many with all those people already. I took pictures, of course, of the prison and yeah. that stuff, but I didn't take a lot of. Uh... Did you bring your recording equipment? Um, I did. I, I brought a lot of that stuff. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, at these events, I, I like to watch how everyone works, and it seems like, right. you know, they're doing the EVP and automatic listen back. So it was I really wanted to experience it. You know, I do so much investigating, so much, um, you know, spent on doing this and doing that. I really wanted to watch. And let me tell you, Bill chapel has got some – he's taken uh, the Xbox Connects and yeah. made a whole new device uh, on how to connect with the paranormal. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he, I, I, I know we're running into Raider, uh, to, to Riders time, but let me just tell you about this. Is this is really interesting. He developed a software to go with the Connects program, and uh, he was filming. Uh, there's two instances. He was filming three empty chairs, and all of a sudden, two small children showed up in these chairs, and they were playing in these chairs. They were like going back and forth, and the way the Connects picks up your body signature, if everyone doesn't understand, it reads your body. Your body becomes the remote control, just like the Wii. Right. And um, it 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 you look like a stick figure with hot points. So there's hot points at your hands, your elbows, your shoulders, right. your two middle vertebrae, your hips, your knees, and your ankles. So you look like a stick figure. And okay. these two things, you saw the camera was empty chairs, but on the connects you saw two figures, and they were like dancing and moving around in their chairs. And then he had another footage where he was at a school with um, Chris Fleming. And Chris Fleming picked up that he was talking to somebody, and all of a sudden, this little kid shows up in the connects in, in, in up on the screen. It was, I'm getting goose pimples. It was crazy. Ooh, wow. so, that's amazing. And how do you know it's kids? I guess because of the size of where they were the smaller. Yeah, you could oh. tell how small they were. They, they were. That they were tall. is oh. phenomenal. Well, we need to go to break. God, I really wanted to hear more about that too. But <laughs> I know it's so interesting. We're going to bring in Ryder after this. So everybody, uh, don't go away. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with Unknown Origins Radio here on the Global Radio Alliance. <laughs> And we're back with Unknown Origins Radio with Mark, Lauren, and Carrie Ann. And tonight's guest is Aaron Ryder, who is currently starring in not one, but two shows on television that involve investigating the unknown. She is literally a world traveler who spent the last few years running all over the planet with Josh Gates on Sci-Fi Channel's hit show Destination Truth, looking for all manner of ghosts and strange creatures. And she's also currently co-starring in the brand new show on Nat Geo, Chasing UFOs. So please welcome Aaron Ryder to the show tonight. How are you tonight, Ryder? I'm doing well. Thank you guys so much for having me. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I mean, we've been really thrilled to have you uh, come on and talk about, again, these, dest- we mentioned a little bit off the air, Destination Truth, we've all been watching it since the very beginning. It's one of our favorite shows, and uh, we just have a blast with that show. And, and I'll tell you up front, one of the reasons that I love Destination Truth so much, compared to all these other shows, is they allow you or you guys are able to show your personalities between Josh Gates and yourself and the rest of the crew. Everybody's personalities shine through, and it is just a kick in the butt. And I really love this show. I don't know how you keep it together, Ryder, because he is hysterical to listen to on TV, and I can imagine he's only ten times funnier off camera. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a blessing to 
be able to go out on the road with him and, and the rest of the crew. It's, it's honestly, it's more play than it is work. And, you know, we're always having a great time and we're glad that that kind of comes across on camera. Um, you know, but in the, in the long run, we end up having to cut all this great stuff out trying to meet, you know, the network needs, but there's so much stuff that we shoot and laugh at, you know, all the time. It's, it's really, it's really a, a great show to produce and work on. Well, you're literally spending days traveling to these locations that are literally on the other end of the of the planet, and spending days traveling. You do your investigation and coming back, you're filming the whole time, and they've got to edit it down to what 22 minutes of airtime for commercials, with most shows being two investigations per hour. So, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot that winds up on the cutting room floor. Now, I was going to ask, um, how did you uh, get involved with the show? How did they uh, did they approach you? Did you audition for it? You know, they ended up approaching me. I've been friends with uh, Casey Brummels and Brad Coleman for some time. And, um, you know, they mentioned me to Josh when they were looking um, at the top of season two to bring on another girl uh, to replace Araceli, who was on uh, the uh, season prior. And uh, I met Josh and we hit it off right away. And, you know, fr- from there, it's it's only gotten better, I think. In the beginning, it was a little bit of a, a learning curve for me, you know, not being on the road with them. But but I picked it up right away, and um, it's uh, it's it's been a hell of a lot of fun. And uh, I don't know where I would be without it. It's it's one of the the best jobs I've ever had. Well, you're like a true life Laura Croft, you know. You're you're the paranormal <laughs> Laura Croft. And so, what were you doing before this, actually? Because that's a lot. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of endurance you're doing out there. <laughs> well, I do have an athletic background. Uh, I've, I've done every sport known to man. Um, I, I just, I love the outdoors. I love travel and this kind of combined a lot of those loves, but, uh, I've been a, a television producer for the past eight years. And this was just a way for me to kind of combine, uh, you know, those, those loves of mine into, you know, my, my, my job. And, uh, I've always kind of been, uh, intrigued by the mysterious and the unknown. And this was a really great way for me to get out there and investigate, uh, not only on camera, but to kind of continue it, you know, off, off camera as well, because it's just something that I'm really, really fascinated by. Yeah. You guys get to get to go to great locations. That's for sure. Well, um, the, whoa, that was weird. Wow. <laughs> with, Excuse with, uh, you. The locations that you guys have gone to, and, you know, they show you traveling so long half the time to get to these locations. In fact, uh, this last week episode, um, when you're over in Eastern Europe and uh, looking for the UFOs, and they had you on a train for how many days? <laughs> Was it three days? Three days. Oh my God. Now, when you actually, I know, and, and a lot of shows do this, and I'm just curious, when you spend so much time getting to these locations, are you actually only investigating for one night, or are they, are you out there for multiple nights and then they're, they're compressing it all into like one investigation in the editing room? Yeah, we, we, we are out there for, for multiple nights. It's really difficult to, as you guys know, you know, if, if you have a location that maybe isn't, hot or you're not really getting anything, you know, there's, there's no reason not to give it another night or two. So yeah, we condense that, um, into one investigation or sometimes we're lucky enough that, you know, we've got room in the episode and we can show the two or three nights that we do spend out there. But yeah, a lot of the times we're out there overnight. A lot of the times we're camping, um, or not sleeping at all. Um, but you know, it's, it's really difficult to do what we do, especially, you know, like you say, it takes sometimes, you know, in Antarctica, it takes, you know, I think it took us five days to finally get there. And when you get there, you really want to make the most of it. So we absolutely, uh, take our time and, you know, we're, we're out there day and night trying to collect as much as possible. And the way you guys get there sometimes is hysterical. I mean, they, mm-hmm. I think sci-fi just, you know, Sorry, sci-fi, maybe you're a little cheap, but Jeepers, Creepers, can you give these guys some transportation that actually works? <laughs> I, I think I, I think Josh finally put his foot down this season, and he was like, we're changing, you know, we're changing the, the, the budget around. I think the Ireland for the, uh, the Banshee episode was the best car we've ever had. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, a lot of the times when we go to these places, they're so remote and so out there that there's no rental car companies or – uh, you know, locations where you can even, you know, borrow a car. A lot of the times 
we're, we're, you know, using our locals vehicles or, you know, someone's, you know, neighbor's friend's car, you know, that that's, that's kind of, you know, how it goes when you're in the middle of nowhere, but we make the most of it. And I think, um, it, it, it makes for great fun, if not, uh, a good challenge. Um, and, and as long as it pisses Josh off, that always makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. When Josh is aggravated, it makes for good television. That's for sure. <laughs> and, and it's true. It's, it's, it's planes, trains, airplanes, donkeys, camels, kayaks, you, you name it. You guys have been in it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I've definitely, and I, I think the worst of them are the animals. I think camels are the dinosaur of, of the mammal and, they do not, they do not want passengers. That's for damn sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, in some of these locations you go to, there is some very real danger. Um, in fact, your season premiere a couple of weeks ago going to Vietnam, which I was very intrigued by that episode, not only because of our history with Vietnam, being able to go back there and seeing the country. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of poisonous snakes. There's a lot of dangerous animals. And in a lot of these other locations, has there ever been a, a time where you were seriously concerned for your safety? You know, I think once the adrenaline gets going and you're out there and you're investigating, a lot of the times you 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 put that aside. And, and it's it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Um, I think I should be more cautious when I am out there. I, I don't really have, I startle very easily, but I'm not, you know, in, I'm not a scaredy cat. So, you know, if Josh says, be careful with putting your hands on the rocks, you know, I'll may think of it for one minute, then I'm, you know, climbing the rocks again and who knows what's in there, snakes, spiders and all that. But I think there was a time when we were in, uh, Indonesia and, and there was actually a, a viper in one of the trees and that was probably the, the most scared I've been uh, by an animal. I think there's other times when you feel as though you've encroached on some territory that you probably shouldn't have, but you feel like you could back up and, you know, give them room and, and you're not, in, you know, any immediate threat. But there's times when you think about snakes in trees or, you know, poison, poisonous, deadly insects, and that's when they just seem so small uh, and, and it's not easy to look out for them and you just have to know you have to be as cautious as you can to a point, and then from there, it's really it's really up for chance. You know, there's a, a there's there's an, uh, a thing that I watch a lot of these programs on. It's called Get Glue, and people are always in the chat room, and it's the funniest thing if people are like, "Who fell? Did anyone fall?" Because it's almost like a drinking game watching your show. Who fell? <laughs> someone is well, always falling. <laughs> well, I tell you what, it's usually me. Then it goes Rex, and then probably Josh. Uh, I am, I am a very athletic, clumsy person, but when you're out there, you know, and a lot of times it looks like we have flashlights and lights, but you, you know, when you do these investigations, it's, you know, if we're doing a paranormal investigation, we don't want any lights on. So now Absolutely. you're on the great wall of China with no real lights on and you're walking around, you're bound to stumble and fall, you know, at a point or two. Plus we're on ice and we're on, you know, loose rocks and, and all that stuff. So I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't fall normally. You know, I'm, I live in LA. I probably fall, you know, two or three times a week, but <laughs> I will say that there are some natural obstacles that do, that do get in the, uh, in the way. Yeah. Josh falling in the river was pretty funny. <laughs> now I noticed that this season there's, they changed up a lot of the cast. Um, I think you're one of the only people returning with Josh this season. It's a brand new uh, team going out. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm missing Rex and Gabe and, and uh, the old team, although I, I do like the new people on the team. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a shame that they weren't able to uh, come on this season. Now, I, I did like the, in the, uh, in the, I think it was on the premiere episode, and, and forgive me, I, I do forget his name. I'm still learning all the new team members' name. The one team member when he and Josh were going up to the cave, and I swear to God, you guys should make t-shirts of this. He goes, why are we always going into, you know, scary, dark, creepy caves? And Josh just deadpan says, cause that's where the monsters are. <laughs> that should be bumper stickers and t-shirts, because that line is so awesome. It, it, it was it was really it was like the most poetic thing of the season. But, you know, I think a lot of people what, what they don't realize is that when we do go out and shoot the show, you know, there are times when we're out on the road almost three or four months. 
So, you know, if people have families, it's really difficult or like Rex, Rex went back to school and he finished up his nursing degree. Gabe ended up um, getting engaged and, um, you know, kind of moving on to some other things. So, yeah, it's it's hard when, you know, life kind of gets in the way of that these aren't people that, you know, are um, actors or, you know, hired to, to, to be out there on the road with us. They're, you know, part of our team for that particular time. And we're just blessed and lucky if we can get them back again. But, um, on this season, you'll see, um, our new medic is Richie. Uh, one of our producers is Katie. We have our tech Tristant. Uh, one of our cameramen is Dave. The other is Kyle who is returning from last season. And then our audio guy is Adam. So a lot of really new faces, but at the same time, I think you'll start to love them as much as you do, you know, some of the past guys. But we're hoping that if we do get picked up again, that we'll be able to get the timing right and bring Rex back or, you know, bring whoever back from, from, you know, kind of the past greats that we've had on the show. Well, if uh, you better be picked up again or we're going to be starting an angry letter writing sorry. campaign because <laughs> I, I do consider this one of the best, if not the best show on sci-fi right now. Yeah. And before we move on to our other show, I, I did, I'm going to, I have to ask you, I know it's probably, you're going to cringe when you hear this, Erin, but what is your favorite location so far? What has been your, your favorite one? It's, it's, it's a, a tie for me because, um, Antarctica was just, uh, not even on my radar or my list because I thought it was so out there uh, that I would never make it. So getting to go there and realizing that it truly is another planet, it's stunning and beautiful like nothing you've ever seen before, that just immediately hits the top of my list. Uh, but Iceland was so spectacular and so um, surprising for me. I think it was one of those places, again, that I might not have have ventured to without the show, but going, it's so gorgeous and people are so friendly and it goes from, you know, glaciers to gorgeous green rolling hills. And, um, you know, I, I really know that I will be going back there. I think Reykjavik is one of my new favorite cities. So, but, but on the show, I mean, we've, we've gone to, I've gone to seven continents and 50 countries, um, on the program alone. And each one has a place in my heart for one reason or another. Wow. No. I, I do. I do have one question, if I could just jump in. Sure. Um, you know, it's about the local food stands that where you tried the native delicacies. Usually my toes usually curl when you when you do it. And I love and hate that part. But what is the weirdest thing you've ever eaten in one of the foreign countries? You know, I think weird is now, uh, you know, something that other people think of. And I don't even think of it as weird anymore. You know, I'll see, you know, we ate scorpions in China or seahorses and uh, you know, that doesn't even seem weird to me anymore, which, which is kind of scary, but <laughs> still, still the, the, the most memorable, um, is the balut, which is the, um, the over ovulated, uh, you know, little chicken <laughs> in the egg. It's literally like feathers and bones and blood. It's not like a delicious egg, like we think egg. Um, but then this season we actually drank, uh, snake blood, um, and snake bile. Uh, it's, uh. it's supposed to add virility and, you know, strength. And let me tell you, it is extremely powerful and I will not be forgetting that taste for the rest of my life. Oh my God, that didn't come up. <laughs> no, it did not come up, thank God. I was just going to say, the balut, I could not do that. I've seen that on other people eating on other shows too. And it's just, oh my God, I couldn't think of the feathers going down my throat. Ugh. Oh, and it's an aphrodisiac for them. <laughs> Lovely. So they're eating a lot. Um, <laughs> one one more question before we switch gears. I, I know that, you know, with Destination Truth, there had been some times where you mentioned life intervenes and there was some, you know, some seasons where you weren't able to be a part of the show. And are there any of those episodes, if you've had a chance to watch them, where you wish that you were a part of that episode, that location? Is there one that really grabs you like, oh, man, I wish I was with them for that one? I would almost say every one, you know, I, I, I'm devastated when I can't go out for a season, but, um, there's a couple that come to mind the, the first time they went to the haunted forest, you know, as much as it seems like there was a lot of life or death moments in that it really truly was one of the most intriguing investigations the teams had. And, um, I was really happy that I got to go back this season. Um, but King Tut's tomb is yes. something that, um, it's, 
I, I will never get to do. Um, the team was really lucky that they were able to go there and explore the way that they did. And I think that that's something that I will always feel as though I should have been on. Um, but, but I think I've been blessed to go on the ones that I have been and maybe lucky that I haven't been in places like Chernobyl. So, you know, it, it's a give or take. A great one. Yeah. Chern- Chernobyl was one of my favorite episodes, but Me I'm sitting too. there going, Oh man, down the road, I'd be afraid to see what would happen medically. Right. <laughs> so, well, you're also on another brand new show, uh, that is actually doing very well that from what I understand for National Geographic Channel, and that's Chasing UFOs. And, uh, I've been watching it since it, uh, first started, and I have to admit, I'm hooked. I'm into it. I'm really enjoying, uh, what you guys are doing. Uh, how did that show come about for you? Um, the show came about, it's actually the same production team, um, and executive producers that do Destination Truth. They also do Finding Bigfoot, and they had for a long time been looking for an outlet for a, a UFO style program. They're, uh, just as much interested in the unknown as we all are. So um, we found actually Ben McGee was one of the first people we found who was a scientist that had written a paper on xenoarchaeology, which is um, the study of uh, archaeology of, of, of different, like say UFOs. If a UFO landed, how could an archaeologist break down that particular site to find out you know, where they come from, who they are and, and, you know, what they're here for. So it was kind of an intriguing idea to be able to go out to these sites and break them down as if it was just a regular archaeology kind of survey. So that's really where it started. And then we were lucky enough to bring James Fox on, who is a brilliant documentarian and researcher and very well known within the UFO realm. So, you know, once the three of us got together, we just did a lot of research on some some topics and sightings that we wanted to look further into. And we just hit the road. Um, you know, we traveled all around the states as well as Brazil and Mexico uh, investigating the season. It, it, well, so you're going out of the country in some upcoming episodes. Yes. So uh, we have a few episodes that are coming up. Uh, that remain. We're on it Fridays at 10 and you'll see, I think we have Florida, Brazil, and Mexico still, uh, yet to have been seen. Wow. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to it. Now, I, you've, you've had a chance actually in this season, you focused a lot on some very famous UFO cases and, uh, meeting with some witnesses last week, I believe, uh, you had on Travis Walton. And, uh, you know, both, uh, Lauren and Carrie Ann, you had, you had the opportunity to meet, uh, Travis last year at Phenomenology. Yeah, he's a nice guy. And, uh, and then you also met with Stan Romanek and, uh, Stan has been on our show a couple of times. I got the chance to meet and hang with him and his wife Lisa, uh, at Phenomenology this year. And, uh, really, really nice people. And, uh, his, his story has always really intrigued me. I don't know if you ever had a chance to read his books, but, some of the some of what's happened to him uh and the way he tells it, it it just leaves you scratching your head it really does we were uh thrilled at the amount of people we were able to talk to regarding sightings and you know different stories all around the US cuz that was what was important is really the sightings in our own backyard and so yeah Stan Romanak you know the that was the first time I had had a chance to meet him and you know I tried to go into it really open minded because there's you know there's obviously two sides to every story and I think you sit down and and you you really know that he's experienced something unusual and he's he comes off him and Lisa come off really honest and um really earnest and just want to share their story so that other people feel comfortable sharing theirs. And I think that that's, you know, they're not really out there shouting from the rooftops. They're kind of, you know, just, you know, getting, getting these, these strange occurrences out there because other people have had these same situations happen to them. And it's like, so who do you go to? Who do you talk to about this stuff? You know? And I think Sam was really great. Well, for the longest time, a lot of people uh, who have experienced these things with either seeing UFOs or having uh, experiences like Stan and Travis have had, you know, there was the stigma for the longest time where you don't talk about it, you keep your mouth shut, or everybody's going to think you're crazy. 
And uh, same with us in what we've learned and with ghost research over the last few years. Uh, it's become a lot more accepted in the mainstream. And these shows, uh, you know, well, there's some good shows and there's some not so good shows, but it has helped broaden the public psyche enough to be able to more broadly accept these things so people like Travis and Stan can get out and tell their stories and then it's up to you know the individual to decide whether or not they believe them absolutely and that was really important to us you know James realizes that he reaches such a narrow uh margin of people with his documentaries that we wanted a broader audience we want people to really understand what is going on out there and, and try to give our opinions on it. And I think, you know, yes, there's going to be two sides of the coin. People are going to like it. People are going to hate it. And, you know, that's just, you know, the, the, the way that these shows work. Uh, but I think the, the thing for me was, you know, when I was younger, I didn't really know about, you know, some of these cases and it took me a really long time to get invested and involved in them. And I would love for, kids younger than, than me even when I started to, to be involved and, and, and be interested in this and be asking questions. I think that's really important is this is a topic where you can ask questions and you don't have to look foolish, you know, wondering what is in our skies because that, that shouldn't be something that should be looked down upon. It just shouldn't. Yeah, and that's a stigma that we deal with, we've dealt with in our society for so many years is you just don't talk about it. You know, anybody in authority and the media laughs at it or they always look at it tongue in cheek. And now we're finally reaching the point where we've, we've kind of reached a global awareness has been raised that people are more accepting of these things and more people are seeing these things too. And now in the very first episode of this season, uh, you, you had a sighting where you saw these lights in the sky and it formed like a ring under under i don't know i almost want to say a craft you couldn't see a craft but that ring of lights uh how did what did you think of when you saw that that was that that was probably the most compelling thing i i saw all season um i had been you know uh following a couple flight paths i'd been looking at planes you know just kind of tracking them and just kind of getting an idea from where they're going and where they're going to and um I'd been following this object that I thought probably was a plane. It looked like it had some, you know, just, you know, normal FAA lights on it. And I was, I was noticing it was getting lower than, than I thought it probably should. And I just kept tabs on it. Uh, then there was this odd flash of light and then that ring lit up and it almost lit up from left to right. And then there was a pause and it did it again. And, um, we were, truly in the middle of nowhere this isn't somewhere where okay helicopters are landing this isn't by an airport this isn't you know um a any kind of big uh, electrical plant or power plant something that might have something like that this is there shouldn't have been anything like that out there um so to capture that and then to to keep the camera up and to go looking and search the skies the rest of the night and see nothing else was was really compelling to me and i think that um it was I always wish, you know, that there's a way to figure out exactly what it was. I, I don't think I ever will. Um, but it, it just excites me to want to be out there even more, you know, and, and collect more evidence. You know, I don't think that that's obviously concrete enough to, to, to prove or disprove anything. But to me, it was something and it was really exciting. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those mysteries that, uh, you know, makes me happy. I do what I do. What struck me about that light is it definitely looked artificial the way it lit up. And it's like you said, it started from left to right. It wasn't like the whole ring lit up at once. It traveled around whatever the light pattern was and then, and then shifted back and forth and looked very artificial, which, which again, it w would rule out a, a natural phenomenon. Uh, now with, all, with the episodes that you've done so far, uh, has there been anything, one of our, uh, our, uh, People in the chat room, Myth024 was asking a question, is there anything in Chasing UFOs that didn't make it to the air but you thought should have? Because we all know that with these shows, so much gets cut out, they have to trim in time for the episode, and maybe there was a piece of evidence or something that happened that you really thought should have been aired. Well, I, I will say that there are a lot of interviews that, that don't make it. That is, it's really you know disappointing for me, but again, it's you know it's just the the, the, the name of the game. Uh, we interviewed Dr. Richard Haynes, who's a, a brilliant uh, scientist and, you know, researcher in the topic of aerial phenomenon and pilots themselves and, 
his interview is something that I, I truly hope we get um, on air uh, at some point in time, even if it's just on the web. Uh, but the biggest thing for me, and I think even for Ben too, was when we were at the Roswell crash site, we not only found the button, but we found uh, deep down, I would say it was probably a foot or two in the ground, um, this this piece of rebar. And then we eventually searched the area further and found about, you know, uh, five feet away, another piece of rebar. And after digging, you know, Ben came to the conclusion that this meant that there was another survey grid that had been done here. Uh, and, you know, that could mean a few things, but it definitely meant that someone was out here searching, whether it was other investigators like ourselves, whether it was the military, whether it was, um, you know, some interested locals, it did mean some other survey grid was out there quite some long time ago. And I think that that was really intriguing. And I wish we had some more time to kind of go into that. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, but that was a, another piece of the puzzle that was was really that we felt uh, could have meant that there was this cleanup that had been going on. Lauren, you had a question? You know, I do. Um and it's in regards to um, we were talking about Stan Romanek and how we got to know him. And we all, we had him on the show in the past and Nick Redfern. And we encountered what we call a men in black interference as we were interviewing him. Have you had any production problems due to your own, say, men in black interference? You know, we, we lucked out a little bit because we did a lot of research ahead of time and we gained a lot of permissions to the people and, you know, the, you know, the things we wanted to talk to, but yeah, we would go to locations and be expecting to speak to a certain eyewitness and they, you know, for one reason or another decided that they didn't want to talk to us. Uh, you know, there was a couple of times when we were down in Brazil that we got stonewalled where, um, you know, we were pretty sure that the military had something to do with it, but cause they had in the past kind of quieting people down and, you know, not letting them, you know, really talk about what, what happened down there. So we didn't, we can't specifically say that it was the military, but in a lot of the instances, it felt as though, uh, there was someone there, you know, kind of ahead of time, especially in Brazil. I would say, I would say mostly Brazil is where it felt like, you know, there was someone there almost ahead of us kind of, uh, clearing, you know, some people out of the way. And people were really shy to talk to us. And when they did talk to us, it felt like we had to get them comfortable for even an hour or two before they revealed anything at all. So, yeah, I, I think that there there is still that, um, quote unquote, men in black out there because there will never be full disclosure. I think we've gotten to the point where we realize that um, it's not something that's going to be beneficial to our government to admit, you know, a, a, any kind of uh, hiding or secrets or any kind of information like that to the public, I don't think that'll ever really happen. So, of course, there's still going to be a reason to keep people from talking. I agree. I agree. It's going to be a secret forever. <laughs> it really yeah. will. Well, uh, I wanted to ask you also, because I know our time is short tonight, uh, there had been recently in the news uh both uh, James Fox and Ben McGee had made some public statements with the, they had some concerns with uh, with the show and i was wondering um if you had your own opinion on that that they felt that at the time when they the show that they were pitched to uh, compared to what was actually started happening in the field wasn't what they thought it was supposed to happen so they weren't exactly happy with it but then they also came back a couple of days later and they, you know, uh, they calmed down a little bit and said, well, you know, it's not that bad. But uh, they did express concern that they wish they had a little more control and say over how the show was shot and what was presented. And I was just curious what your thoughts were on that. You know, I think on a new show like this, there's a, there's a few things that happen. Obviously, uh, early expectations of the show kind of go through this change as you come back. Or, you know, we took a few breaks while we were out there as people start seeing the show and the network and the executives decide that they want this to happen now or that to, you know, change or what have you. And, and we shot a lot out there because we weren't quite sure um, exactly what we wanted to communicate. And I think, you know, if you were, you know, myself or Ben and James, 
we all favor different interviews, different sighting stories, different parts of the investigations, and they don't always make air because we do only have, you know, a, a short amount of time to communicate everything that we shot. And while we were out there, we were out there in, in some instances for, for seven or eight days in one particular location. So, um, I think everyone's got their own point of view. Everyone has their own expectations and it doesn't always necessarily mean that they're going to get met. I think the guys, unfortunately, were kind of, you know, they were venting on a Facebook page and it was um, taken into, uh, you know, made to look like they had spoken to a journalist or, you know, kind of uh, said this to the press, which they didn't. They were just kind of, you know, talking on Leslie Keene's Facebook page, who is a good friend of James, and he felt as though he was, you know, kind of had his back up against the wall. And I think we all kind of say things like that when, we're under the gun and under, you know, this, this certain pressure, especially since, you know, you're going to get negative press more than you're going to get positive press. So, um, I will say that the, you know, the guys have, uh, obviously they feel terrible about it, but at the same time, listen, it's, it's the way of the world. Um, you know, you can ask any producer at the end of a show and they'll say, of course, there's things that I wish happened or there, of course, there's things that I want changed. I think, it, you know, it'll always be that way. Um, but I just think, you know, this was a lot of trial and error. We did a lot of really good things. Great. There's some other things that we can work on and it'll only make season two that much better, you know, now that the guys know what they want and, um, you know, what we can do moving forward. I know that, uh, oh, just real quick, Gary, the, the one thing as a fan of the show that I do like is I like, the t- the camaraderie between the three of you you have a great chemistry i love the cast and i think that that's one of the things that really makes the show for me so you know i'm really hoping that you know this show is uh, continued and uh, you all continue to work together and carrie Ann, you had a question uh that's okay now um are you um you mentioned tonight in fact uh just so everybody understands, uh, Aaron has to leave us here in a few minutes because uh, she's running out the door. Now, you mentioned uh, you're going to be going and doing some more filming. Now, are you still continuing to film season one, or has this uh, been renewed for another season? Well, as someone, some people kind of know, um, you know, some of the promotion for the show, we actually put together this really incredible um, idea for the 35th anniversary of the WOW signal which was a, a signal received in 1977 uh, to SETI uh, when they were, um, you know, basically listening into space. They, they actually re- received some sort of communication, some sort of signal. So I'm actually heading down to Arecibo in Puerto Rico where the largest radio telescope exists. And um, we're going to be doing some, some shooting down there. And I'm excited about it because this is, this famous site where the movie contact was filmed and X files and all this other great stuff. Plus we have this, you know, really brilliant idea where we're going to send, um, these tweets into space. And a lot of the messages were, were really incredible. And, um, I think it's, it's a cool idea to, um, you know, celebrate the 35th anniversary of the wow signal with a wow reply. And that's what I'm down there to do. So when do you expect that? Does, do you expect that to be aired uh, later this season or uh, later in the year? I'm not sure just yet. Um, you know, I'll know more a, li- a little bit more about it when I actually get down there. So the minute I get more information, I'll throw it up on my uh, Facebook or uh, Twitter so everyone can kind of know when to look out for that. Okay, great. Uh, well, Ryder, we know your time is short. You're, you're waiting to be, uh, to literally run out the door. Uh, but we want to thank you very much for coming on the uh, show tonight. Uh, now, do you do any personal appearances? Do you should go to any of the conventions or anything or do any speaking? I, I, I haven't in the past. Um, it's something that I've actually started to do just recently and I'm really excited about. Uh, I don't have anything on the books just yet. We've been in talks about a few things coming up in the future. So the minute I know more, uh, I'll, I'll again let everyone know. I think Comic Con was a, was a really nice start for you know some some future projects coming up. So uh, you can definitely expect some investigations and some some public speaking events as well as some other um, you know kind of fun events coming up that that I will be making appearances at. We cool. know a little event that takes place in Gettysburg in March. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have those people get in touch with you. Hopefully, we, maybe we can see you there. I'd love that. I would absolutely love that. 
Well, Aaron, thank you very much for coming on. We ran a little late tonight to accommodate you, and, and we would wish you luck. Have a safe uh, trip. And thank you very much for coming on the show tonight. This has been a great time talking to you. Yeah, a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, Carrie Ann, and, and, and Lauren. I, I truly appreciate you guys helping out with this. And um, tomorrow night is another Destination Truth. We'll be at To Call. Um, it's an incredible haunting. Uh, tomorrow, 9 p.m. on Sci Fi. And then this Friday, uh, Chasing UFOs will be on at 10 p.m. So check those out. And uh, thank you so much, guys. I will uh, be in touch from Puerto Rico. Good. Excellent. Safe journeys. Safe journeys. Have a safe yeah. trip. Talk to you okay, soon. Bye, guys. And with that, we're going to go ahead and go to break. And Welcome back to Unknown Origins Radio, where we talk about everything having to do with the strange and paranormal. And I'm your host, Mark Johnson, along with Lauren DePinto and Carrie Ann Versace. Ladies. Hola. Hola. <laughs> you both did that at the same time. Uh, let, me, let me tell you, if I could covet anyone's job, it's hers. First oh, off, God, yeah. to work side by side with Josh Gates, let me tell you, how much fun would that be? Oh, and to go up to the yeah, what an adrenaline rush, right? Oh my gosh, you'd be laughing and then just like the only thing is like uh, like I, I've talked about this before, going through the jungles with all the spiders and all the icky stuff. The you know, Josh would have to really make me laugh <laughs> to get through that. You could say he'd really have to protect me. <laughs> yeah. it's, like, well, it's, it's a shame we couldn't. Um, she couldn't stay with us for the last half hour, but we totally understand. You know, when you're catching a car and flying to Puerto Rico and filming your oh, show, cool. you know that does take precedence. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, I just, uh, you know, there were some questions I really wish I could have asked her a little bit more about the shows and, uh, especially what she does in the off time. Right. Uh, when right. She's not doing these shows. She did mention that she, uh, she was like a personal trainer, I believe. Well, uh, in she her said past she actually, well, she said she actually does other shows or she does other things. So, uh, maybe that's how, you know, there is downtime as we know, you know, she, she said they're on for three months and then they're off for, you know, until they call them back. And, you know, sometimes, you know, like with what happened when uh, I guess she was involved in another project and that's how come she missed a season here or there. So I mm. guess, you know, it all depends on, on how things work out. But mm. I just wanted to – one other thing I wanted to add is, you know, that, that show is like yeah. Amazing Race but with Destinations and the Paranormal in it. And, and Amazing Race is one of, one, of my, one of the shows I'd love to be on but then throw in – the whole destination truth aspect of it. It's, I, I, you know, I love that show. I can't help it. I am a huge fan of that show. I mean, what place haven't they gone to yet? That's something I wanted to ask. And, you know, where she would, you know, want to end up going to. Like, wh where haven't they gone? Well, I think they've been to every continent now, especially mm -hmm. since they went to Antarctica. There's mm -hmm. millions of, I mean, millions of spots they could go to around the planet, uh, even in the same countries, different locations. One of the things that I always like is because they are all so active and, you know, they're trekking around and what do they do? They come to a cliff and it's like, oh, we can't go any further. Well, break out the Delay. Yeah. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. In the that's dark, just, too. That's, that's the best. solution to everything. Break out the climbing gear. Well, and, see, that, uh, I, I wanted to ask if they had got, if she ever got hurt. You know, they have the medic on, st on you know, in the te on the team. I mean, did she ever get, like, serious or did anyone ever get seriously hurt? I don't think she, I think she probably would have said so when we asked her about, uh, how the danger and she said she was scared. I think she might have, yeah, she would have added yeah. to that. I, I honestly don't, I don't recall anyone getting seriously hurt. Yeah. You know, other than that guy having issues in the haunted field or whatever. The haunted oh, with his, with his ear, the blood? With his ear. And then the first time round, I think something happened to him too. Yeah. Oh. He, he was thrown. He was picked up and, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was thrown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was always annoyed with sci-fi for how they cut that because they always did it as a jump cut. And, you know, being the investigator, I would have liked to have seen his whole camera footage from the moment he's hit 
to the moment he lands. And they always show the long shot of him getting first getting thrown back. Then they cut to the shot of him screaming. And then they don't even show him hitting the ground or anything that happens afterwards. So, you know, that, that they're, they're doing it. They're cutting it for, you know, suspense and, uh, and drama, but you know, I wish I could have seen that whole footage because I really want to see how the the dynamics of how that all happened. Do you think yeah. any of that stuff is salvaged though? I mean, you know, to someone like us, you know, we we find that to be very important evidence, you know, and and to have that on hand to refer back to is great. But to them, it might be just their job, chop chop chop, and then you know, get it on the get it on the air. So you know, do you think, any do you of think that, that they, yeah? No, I was just saying, any of that footage, it belongs to the production company. Right. So, you know, it's never going to see the light of day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's actually, gone. yeah, I wonder, you know, if anyone out there, you know, that has bought the DVD uh, selection, maybe there might be some uncut stuff in there. I mean, you know, the missing scenes and deleted scenes, mm-hmm. blooper reels. Right. But like she, like she was saying, she said, I hope, I don't even know if that was on air, though, where she was talking about how, how funny it is to work with him. Because uh, we, we were talking so much beforehand, but honestly, I, I can't imagine uh, being part of that crew. They they must have so much fun, you know. Yep, yeah. But I also wanted to ask too if he ever had a cranky day. You know what I mean? Uh, He's so positive uh, and up, you know, he, fun. But there have been episodes where you could tell he's getting pissed. <laughs> really? I, I don't. I never recognized any of those. No. Either with the camel. Or, or with a car that's breaking down, or, you know, he just, you could just tell that his patience is getting worn thin. But usually he's cracking a joke or making a joke out of it. Yeah. He is off the cuff funny. He is just so quick and so silly. You know, you can't help but laugh watching that show. It's perfect. Well, he's, our sen- he's our sense of humor, that quick, cut, dry sense of humor. It's like, you know, it's like as sharp as a knife and hysterical because you, it's just the funny, it's funny. It's, he he's so larger than life in the paranormal world. I mean, is he pretty much untouchable as far as like he doesn't go to events, does he? You know, he has probably the best contract ever. I mean, he, how many shows do you see him on? He's on everything, oh, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, well, you know, he yeah, does the he does the special guest for um for the ghost hunters whenever they do a live show. Right. And, uh, there there was one time is I think you can find it on YouTube. He. You know, he was always trying to get into show business in some form as either a host of a show. And he filmed an audition for some game <gasps> show. Yes, I where saw he, that. He was going to talk his way into Disneyland without having to pay. <laughs> oh my God. No, I have to and, see it. Uh, and he oh, goes, I'll send it to you. It's funny. Oh, it's funny because he's mic'd. The camera is shooting from a long shot far away so they don't see him, but he's <laughs> mic'd so you can hear and he's telling the sob story about, oh, his wife and kids are inside. He came out to the car, but he came back in. He doesn't have his ticket and blah, blah. It took him, I think, 10 minutes and he talked his way in and he went to Disneyland without having to pay. <laughs> and it's it's definitely even much better than how Mark described it because it is so funny. It's his humor. He's younger though, and he's, he's a little thicker, but he is just him. He is just dynamite. <laughs> so funny. But I will send that to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, I'm when you were forward asking, to meeting him. Yeah, I would love to meet him and talk mm-hmm. to him. He just seems like such a great guy. Um, you know, when we were asking Ryder about those locations, she didn't get a chance to go on. Uh, you know, I have to say, I think the Chernobyl episode is my all-time favorite, followed Absolutely. closely by the by the King Tut's tomb. Y- you want to talk about? It's amazing that a small show, and, and you know, for what it's worth, on sci-fi and mostly shows, they're not like big network shows. They don't get the audience or the ratings uh, that the big uh, three networks get. But they've got some clout, and maybe it's because of how they approach their investigations. But to get past, especially in Egypt. Which mm-hmm. the, you know, the Minister of Antiquities there that runs the whole show. And I don't know if, um, Zawi, oh, wow, what was his name? Ah, oh, crap. He's on all these documentaries. The Egyptian archaeologist who was the head for a while. He is a real pain in the butt and real hard to get past. So to get the permission to get in there and film in King Tut's tomb, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I almost said something crude there, but I don't know who they had to do to get in there, but. <laughs> That was oh, an awesome. That, that, I just had been, that was in poor taste because I was just thinking of all these terrible jokes. Yeah, me too. Not but, going you know, there. We have a PG rated show, folks. <laughs> now, now, let me ask you: If you had the chance to work with Josh Gates, would you dress up in a uh, radiation suit and go into Chernobyl? 
Sure. Uh, in a heartbeat. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Easily. You know, deal, Easily. deal with your hair falling out later and oh, bleeding God. gums. And... Now you've got your suit on, you know. <laughs> Please. Yeah, well, the suit isn't 100% protection. I mean, when, remember the, when they had the little sensors and they had so many rads per hour spike, they had to get out of that area because they were getting contaminated. The one thing yeah. they didn't show is did they have to do the uh, showers when they got out of there where they're getting scrubbed down with big old, you know, floor brooms. But what was that movie? That was – what was that movie? Oh, gosh, with Cher. Oh, with oh, Cher. Silkwood? Oh, yeah, Silkwood. Silkwood. Silkwood when they had to scrub them down. Oh, that was yeah. frightening. Yeah. That was a little taste of Chernobyl. Yeah, that's how you get the uh, radiation off. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Guys, so, I have to let you know Roger just walked in and he says hello. And oh, do you hear him God. purring? Could do you hear him purring? He's so loud right now. No, I don't hear him. Oh. Well, he sends his so love. Have, have, you, have, you, um, have you guys been keeping up with uh, chasing UFOs? Have you been watching the show? Um, uh, I've been so busy because it's on a Friday night, the show, right? So I have been like running around like a loon, you know, finishing up uh, softball and stuff. So I'm I'm free now. Yeah, I saw a few, and most of them I have on the DVR, so I'm going to yeah. be watching. The last couple they've done have been pretty good. Um, you know, I understand, you know, there's been a lot of criticism on the show and, you know, we talked a little bit with Ryder about that. And there are some, there are some big investigators out there. In fact, uh, past people we've interviewed on this show, which we won't name names because, you know, we, we're not trying to put anybody down, but who've been extremely critical of the show. And, uh, you know, I, I will say, especially with the first episode, it reminded me of a clone of Finding Bigfoot, except, you know, you're running around looking for UFOs and lights right. instead of creatures in the woods. But uh, thankfully, they got away from that town hall thing that they did the first episode. I, I and they started doing some different things. And um, I thought the uh, the Roswell episode was very interesting. And uh, the only thing I wish they could have shown more, they had the gentleman show up with the little fragments that he supposedly found out there mm-hmm. that he had in the box. Okay, it's like okay, here's what I found. Okay, puts it away. Okay, now you guys go find your thing. <laughs> no, not allowing anybody to analyze it or look at it. <laughs> You know, I was uh, not to go back to the station truth. The whole UFO thing that they just saw last week was pretty weird. Uh, Didn't they see something in the skies that they couldn't identify? And they even took it to uh, a guy and he couldn't identify it. On Destination Truth, they did. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, they. um, I mean, I love Joss's reaction. He's just got this f bombs ten times. (laughs) What the bleep am I looking at? (laughs) <laughs> I've never heard him swear so much ever, but those, that was something else. I, uh, you know, you know me and my skepticism and that was pretty something. And I do love that they bring it to, to, uh, um, you know, someone in the field that is uh, an expert. And he was like, uh, I don't know. You got something there. <laughs> Speaking of uh, skepticism, I had to segue a little bit. You know, this is what I wanted to bring up to her. It's, I, I've read this in a few articles that they she either terms herself or, or someone labels her a skeliver. Have you ever heard of that before? Skeliver? Oh. <laughs> I was going to bring that up and go, explain, skeliver. Skeliver. No, skeliver. I, I know. I know I've read a couple of articles. I'm like, skeliver, that keeps popping up. <laughs> oh, so that's what, that, that's the skeptical believer. Oh, yeah. God, that's I don't so that's, like that's that a new term. <laughs> Skeliver. Uh-uh. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mark. I cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that's quite all right. <laughs> Skeliver. <laughs> we're just rambling here. We are. But we're having fun. Yeah, we are. We are. Like I said, yeah, it's a shame she had to leave because uh, I, I really enjoyed talking to her. And then, you know, we got to talk. Dana, if you're listening. <laughs> oh, we got yes. For phenomenology for you. And, and there would go the whole budget. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Mark, we'll Mark forgets that. Mark forgets that. You know, it, it is little nephew that, that that pays for phenomenology. That, he, that's, he forgets. That's a, that's a that's a long car ride for Chris Borman to go pick her up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they can work out some kind of barter situation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good God. So oh, anything else? New and, uh, and interesting in the news, Mark. I know you like to keep up on this yes. craziness. Right. Talk about your Couple alligator. <laughs> well, well, there are two two types of animal 
sightings or things that have happened. Well, the first one is, uh, do you know, have you ever heard of the Montauk Monster? Would this mean Long Island? Yes. Okay, no. <laughs> if you Google it, there, a picture will come up of a very strange creature that was found washed up on a beach. It looks like a, a like a, a, a dog in the sense that it had, you know, the f- four legs and a head, but it was this fat thing with this beak. It was the strangest creature I've ever seen. And even the back legs almost looked like hands. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Really yes. Yes. It- looked like a Creeps fat, swollen say, rat yeah, I- to me. Bart, what did it look like? To me, it looked like a fat, swollen rat. I mean, without anything, you know, in the in the picture to sort of give it some sca- some scale, it looked to me like it was just a fat, swollen rat. With, with really? no well, wait, how big is it, Mark? I'm not sure because, as Grace pointed out, there's not a lot of scale. But oh, they okay. found another one this time underneath Brooklyn Bridge over the weekend, and there's pictures of that online. And it looks very, very similar. Uh, to the creature that was found in Montauk a few years ago. Mm. Mm. So uh, if the, if you want to look at that, actually the Huffington Post had an article on it uh, today where it's just it was, it's bloated, obviously. It's in rigor mortis. It has no hair, but the body features and the face, it has like this beak on the end of its face. I mean, it's really, really strange. That thing creature. is bizarre looking. Yeah, yeah weird. really weird. That that beak thing to me, Mark, really, that's what drives it home that something's amiss with that creature, whatever that is. Now, both creatures are found near water. Or is it possible they're an amphibious or aquatic creature? Um, I don't know. And and again, they are both in advanced stages of decomposition, so they're extremely bloated. The skin is dried out. Uh, it, it could be a, a regular animal misidentified, but I'm looking again that face and the and the feet. And I'm going. I have no idea what that could be. It is weird. It has like pig ears. I'm looking at the picture now, but it has an odd mouth. I don't know. But again, you know, <laughs> when it's in that form of decomposition, it's all bloated and it's been in the water. You know, how could you really tell? That's strange. Well, anything floating in the book in the river, <laughs> I mean, you never know if it lives in the river. It's a mutant, you know. I mean, you don't know what's going on down there. It's terrible. Well, being as that you're formerly from Garfield and you have the Passaic River right there, you know, I'm sure you're used to seeing floaters going by. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Garfield used to be the dumping ground back in like the mobster days for bodies, and they used to find them in you know garbage cans, you know, by the factories and stuff. So yeah, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> My, my niece, Find when my niece Find was first learning to, when my niece was first learning to talk, uh, she was riding with us one day and we're p- cry- going over the river. So I purposely pointed out and go, "Look, Brooke, floaters." And she was, <laughs> <laughs> did you guys? Did, did you guys happen to see that picture of that frog that was like fifty-seven pounds? Oh my god! <laughs> did you see it? It yes, was posted I saw. by by that desert museum. So I have to believe that it's legitimate. It was posted by a museum. So I don't know. I, I like, thought it was Photoshop myself. I've never seen a frog that big in my life, ever. Well, I would hope not, or you'd have the picture on your Facebook page. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I I looked at it, and I don't it, I don't know if it's photoshopped or not. But I, I you know we're talking about strange things, and I was like, I saw that, and I was like, this thing is gigantic. It, I've seen some pounds. frogs that were about the size of a volleyball. But oh, no, never this is 57 that pounds. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. The guy's holding it up, and his feet are on the ground, and its head is at the, almost at his chest. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's pretty big. Sure it's not anything like that cat, you know, that they hold in the pictures, you know, the oh. big fat cat? <laughs> oh, wait. Well, here, here Lauren, here's, here's, here's a great little factoid. It, it dispensed okay. two gallons of urine when it got captured. <laughs> 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 you know, after the show, I have to do the same. <laughs> How did they measure that? I wonder what the warts would look like from that. Is it what they would be dumped in the shoes? Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, God. Warts would look like cannonballs. There, there, there oh, there was another animal story this week, and I find this one very poetic. There was a, um, a man in Florida whose hand was bitten off by an alligator, so he was charged with unlawful feeding. Oh, uh, Mark, really? Well, the, the the headline was funny, but what it was is the guy was a tourist, uh, a tour guide, with people, and he would like hold out food for the alligators to come and feed him to come up close to the boat, and one jumped up, grabbed his hand, and bit it off. 
So not only did he lose his hand, he had to pay a fine for losing his hand. <laughs> oh, that sucks. You're in the hospital and you're like, oh, I'll never play the piano again. And some cop walks in with like a, you know, a fine. Here you go. <laughs> <A citation>. <laughs> <laughs> like, find the gator, cut him open. <laughs> I want my hand back. I can't <laughs> sign it. I don't have my hand. Get the hook. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that's, that's bad. <laughs> it, it, it's like, you know, I feel bad for the guy, but you should, you should not be feeding the gators. They will eat you. I, I just, I don't think you should be able, you know, I, I know they have to kill them to, cause they'll overpopulate and all of that, but, you know, they're some of the oldest creatures on this planet, you know, and I just, I, I revere them. I don't think you should eat them and all that, but I guess that's, you know, that's just me. <laughs> I totally, totally agree with you there. <laughs> you know, I know, it's, I know it's weird. I know it is, but I mean, every time I look at one, it is, it just looks so, you know, it, it just looks like a, a a living dinosaur from millions it and millions does. of years ago. It does. Doesn't even look alive. Does that damn thing would eat like your it ass for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not even the alligators that scare me so much. It's it's would be the crocodiles. Oh goodness in, gracious! In say South America and in Australia, because those things will eat you in a heartbeat. Oh. People get caught all the time, tourists, you know, doing their walkabouts, or they go and they walk too close to the water, and the crocs are just sitting there right under the water, and they come up. Mm, crap. Mm, mm. Did you ever have an alligator fritter? Tastes like chicken. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it does. Harriet, it tastes- Harriet do you remember that place in Pompton Lakes that was, uh, it was a Louisiana uh, kind of restaurant right on uh, Hamburg Turnpike, I think it was? I think I do. Yeah, well, it's not there anymore, but they would serve Louisiana, you know, type meals, Creole and stuff like that. And one of the appetizers was, you know, alligator fritters. And years ago, yes, I had an alligator fritter. (laughs) Would I have it again? uh, It does taste like chicken. No, I'm not kidding. You know, uh, my cousin was had fried chicken out and I was eating it and I was, you know, it was just a little chewy, but it. He's like, you know, that's Gator they just shot down the street. And I was like, what? <laughs> just shot I down the street. Gator. And I will there's, there's a little poodle in there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Hey, guys, good. congratulations. You made uh, you made the top five. You made it to three on TSL rankings tonight and trending Ooh. heavily. Yeah, right. baby. Yoo-hoo. Way ahead of Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck, Laura Ingram. Um, you you know, you guys actual. are up there. Oh, Mark. Thank oh, you, Mark. everybody, for uh, helping boost us up to there. We we really love you. Thank you very much. Uh, you, we have the greatest fans out there. Yeah, hey. and we're sorry that Ryder couldn't stay longer. Uh, you know, we're disappointed too, but you know, she's still filming. So, yes. Well, uh, I think that's we're actually come to the end of the hour, so that's wrapping it up here for us here at Unknown Origins Radio. So, uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Be sure to tune in every Monday night here at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Global Radio Alliance. And we sign off with our motivational quote of the week. Just remember, there in life, there are no stupid questions. Just stupid people. Have a good night. Have a good night. That's the, that's the moment that makes us all cringe when Mark says, yeah. <laughs> I know, I wait for this. I live for you. Good night, everyone.